On December 6, 2014, at 8.07 p.m., Latroy Rudd and Glenn Williams place a call to the Panola County Sheriff's Office to report a vehicle engulfed in flames just off the side of Heron Road in Cortland, Mississippi. Two minutes later, at 8.09 p.m., firefighters and emergency medical services arrive on the scene. On December the 6th of 2014, you responded to a car fire. Yes, sir. When I arrived, I pulled on up to where the car was on fire, and... What did you see? I, I saw Jessica standing in the road. What was this person wearing? When I seen her, she had nothing on but her pants. I got out and I got a blanket, and she had her arms out, was coming towards me, saying, help me, help me, help me. Nicole, I want you to describe for this jury, what did she look like? What was the condition of Jessica Chambers? Her hair was fried out like she had stuck it in a light socket. And uh, she had black all over her face. Her body was severely burned. And I wrapped the blanket around her to conceal her. She reached out for my hand. I held on to her hand. And her, her mouth, this how her mouth was just charred black. And when I asked her her name, she said, Jessica Tambers. And she was not recognizable to me. I, I, I know what Jessica Chambers looked like. Knowing this is Cortland, I said, this is Jessica Chambers, not Tambers. In all your years of being a firefighter, have you ever seen anything like this? No, sir. I hope I never see anything like it again. Cole, let me ask you one final question. As of today, are you currently on the Cortland Fire Department? Sir, I'm not. Your Honor, I have no further questions. I would ask that he be finally excused. The man you were just listening to is Cole Haley. As alluded to during his testimony, Cole was just one of the firefighters that responded to the call on the evening of December 6th. As they arrived on the scene, they came upon what has been described as a zombie-like version of a burned woman walking away from her burning car. Although this woman was still able to walk and even attempt to speak, it was very apparent that her life was at risk as she was visibly burned from head to toe, blinded by the fire, and her breathing was extremely labored. As these first responders did their absolute best to provide life-saving aid to the victim, they asked her, who did this to you? She then attempted to respond through her very debilitating injuries, and all of the responders believed they heard her say, It was Eric. 19-year-old Jessica Chambers was then transported by helicopter to the Memphis Hospital burn unit where she received emergency medical treatment. It was found that Jessica had obtained burns to over 93% of her body, and doctors quickly determined that life-saving efforts would not be effective. On December 7th at 2.36 a.m., Jessica Chambers took her last breath while holding her mother's hand. A special investigations task force was assembled over the 48 hours that followed, and the hunt for the killer began. While some of the members of this team worked to gather and examine evidence, others focused their efforts on speaking to anybody with the name Eric or Derek that was known to be in the area on the night of December 6th. Strangely, everybody with the name Eric or Derek was quickly cleared after not only providing alibis, which were easily corroborated, but also by allowing investigators to search through their location history using their cell phone data. One man named Derek Turner, who was known to hang out in the same social circle as Jessica, was quickly arrested and questioned. However, this early on in the investigation, police had not yet released to the public that Jessica had named her attacker on the scene. What did they tell you they were investigating the death of Jessica Chambers? This man. I tracked down this man, 31-year-old Derek Turner, just hours after he was released from jail Wednesday, where he was questioned about Jessica Chambers. I was just called in to, you know, uh, in for an interview uh, about a situation I ain't know nothing about. Turner said he knew Chambers. But I don't just know her like that because I'm, I'm oh, way older than her. So I seen her around at the stores and everything, but I don't just know her like that. 
what Turner did know. The times that I was around her, you know, she carried herself. She was she was a good girl. She was a sweet girl. So that's why I'm messed up about it. Whatever happened to her, I hate it happen, you know. Turner, taken into custody Monday, still has no idea what led investigators to him. They didn't tell me what, what reason why they had me, you know, uh, what, uh, who said what or what. So, I mean, I don't know how my name even came up in After days behind bars? You no, know, they didn't have nothing, you know, to hold me for, so they had to let me go. Investigators worked around the clock as they eliminated potential suspects in the small town of Cortland, which only has a population of around 500 people. Since a vast majority of evidence would have been burned in the fire, investigators only had a handful of leads to follow in search of the killer, and with the name Eric taking them nowhere, they decided to make a plea to the public for assistance. There's not a lot of street talk out there about who may or may not have done this, so it's making our job a little bit more difficult, and that's why we're appealing to the public uh, I know that Crime Stoppers does have a reward for this. So anybody with information, we're asking the police come forward. Um, the Cortland community is a small community. Uh, so we feel like somebody out there knows something or has heard something uh, that just has not come forward yet. And we're asking um, the community to help us with this. The case immediately went viral due to its shocking and dramatic nature, appearing on several news stations and even making it to the front of People magazine. With the hopes of gathering more information, Jessica's sister also created a Facebook page titled Justice for Jessica. This page received over 150,000 followers in the first 24 hours. And as with most online discussion groups, the rumor mill kicked into overdrive. Some people insisted that this wasn't a murder at all. Instead, it was actually a mechanical car fire. Some insisted that it was her father, Ben, as Ben has openly stated that he does not support interracial relationships. Meanwhile, Jessica took part in several herself. Some believed that it was a drug or gang-related assassination, while others even went as far as working together to prove that it was one of her ex-boyfriends, referring to them by name and even sending these men harmful or threatening messages. All of these rumors were proven to be just that, rumors. The way the vehicle was burned indicated that the fire had been started from the driver's seat, with gasoline used as an accelerant. Jessica's father, Ben, was actually a mechanic that worked for the local police and had a confirmed alibi at the time of the murder. Any suspicions of gang or drug relation seemed to be disproven. Although Jessica had a few years living a dangerous lifestyle, between 15 and 18 years old, many people have stated that she was steering clear of these types of situations over the year leading up to her death. And the two ex-boyfriends that were garnering suspicion online had already been interviewed and eliminated as suspects. Investigators had also already spoke with a man named Quentin Tellis that Jessica had been texting and calling over the 17 days leading up to her murder and throughout the day of her murder. Quentin was also ruled out. Throughout the first month following Jessica's death, investigators managed to question over 100 people and create a solid timeline of Jessica's day. They also heavily examined a handful of key pieces of evidence. At the scene of the crime, police found Jessica's car and remaining clothing to have been covered in gasoline. They then found her keys about a quarter mile down the road, thrown into the trees. They found that at 4.15 p.m., just four hours before EMS arrived on the scene, that Jessica had spoken to her mother on the phone, stating that she would be home soon. Her mother claimed that this phone call was very strange because it was eerily quiet. They also found text messages on Jessica's phone between Jessica and the man previously mentioned named Quentin Tellis. And finally, they uncovered surveillance footage from the only gas station slash convenience store located in the small town of Cortland. This footage is where investigators decided to direct their focus.
This footage captured Jessica at 5.24 p.m., just over two hours before the fire. At first glance, this footage didn't appear to provide much in terms of potential suspects. However, while researching each of the people seen on the recording, investigators felt that they needed to speak with one man in particular. George Mister, a.k.a. Boone. Boone had a criminal history of aggravated assault, violence towards women, and drug trafficking. And he had just recently been released from prison, less than a year from the date of the fire. The police then apprehend Boone at the same gas station. He was surrounded and arrested at gunpoint. George Mister and Rachel Tudor say they're the latest to be questioned in Jessica Chambers' murder. I took a lie detector test. I took a... Uh... Swap tears. Investigators wouldn't confirm the pair was questioned, but a jail log shows Mr.'s name on the date in question. Tudor isn't listed, but I did see her in the jail parking lot. They questioned me about a text message that I sent Jessica two days before she died. And uh, I guess that was why they may have thought something. I don't know. These two say they both know Jessica. How'd you know Jessica? Mm, she's a good friend. Yeah. But tell me they have no idea how she was set on fire and found near her burning car in Cortland. It's saying that, uh, I... It was a lover's core. It was a lover's core. You know, a lover's core. They, that's they question it about. District Attorney John Champion estimates around 100 people have been questioned. I knew Jessica pretty well, and we hung out, and we had our differences, ups and downs, but, you know, no, none of us were really ever imagine doing something like that to her. We don't know. You know. I don't know what what the problem was that got her killed. When speaking with the authorities, Boone seemed to have an alibi. However, he also had some new information for the investigators. Apparently, Boone had seen Jessica around 11 a.m. on December 6th. He stated that Jessica was actually a drug addict that would frequently be around Boone and his friends as, in his words, she was looking for love and somebody to care for her because her daddy was mean and racist. He stated that that morning she had visited him with a handful of crystal meth, asking for him to trade it for some cocaine. Boone said that he then turned her down and watched her leave and didn't hear from her again. Since the investigators were relatively empty-handed in terms of evidence against Boone. Boone was then released from custody. As the months went on, the reward increased incrementally. Unfortunately, investigators found themselves at a standstill until they made another discovery within the gas station footage. That discovery was Jessica's vehicle pulling into a driveway across the street from the store. This was the driveway of Quentin Tellis. Since Quentin had already been spoken to and ruled out, investigators had slowed down any further attempts to connect him with the murder. However, this finding seemed to contradict a statement that he had made during their conversations. Investigators decided to obtain a warrant to review Quentin's cell phone location history. This showed that Quentin's cell phone was pinging off the exact same towers as Jessica's throughout the hours leading up to and during the burning. Jessica's keys were then immediately tested for Quentin's DNA, which came back positive. And finally, about 14 months after Jessica's death, Quentin Ellis was charged with capital murder. A Cortland man has been charged with capital murder in the death of Jessica Chambers. As we reported, Chambers was found burned alive in the rural Mississippi town in December of 2014. Until now, there had been no suspects named. WJTV's Terrence Friday spent the day in Panola County where the announcement was made. At the press conference today, investigators revealed that this wall was filled with the names and photos of people believed to have been responsible for the death of Jessica Chambers. After more than a year, they narrowed it down to Quentin Tellis. Tellis was arrested in August of 2015 after he used a stolen credit card that belonged to a Chinese exchange student that was killed in Louisiana. Now he's been named the primary suspect in the death of Jessica Chambers as well. A lot of the details that a lot of people want to know are being withheld until that information is presented to the jury. We now know at this point that the suspect is believed to have acted alone, and investigators say they're confident that he's the right person. We do not anticipate at this point there being any other charges against any other individuals. Uh, we do feel like at this point that he acted alone in this case uh, um, and that we do not at this point. I'm, I'm never going to be 100% about anything. You never know in this world, but I, I'm, I, I'm fairly 
very, very confident that we will not have any other charges against any other suspect. As mentioned in that news segment, Quinton had moved to a neighboring county, where he was eventually charged for using a debit card that belonged to a foreign exchange student named Mandy, who had been found dead in her apartment on August 8, 2015. In the weeks leading up to Mandy's death, several tenants stated that they witnessed Quinton and Mandy talking on the stairs outside. Cell phone data also placed Quinton within 200 feet of Mandy's apartment the night before she was discovered. Since there was no DNA or physical evidence tying Quinton to Mandy's murder, homicide charges had not yet been placed. However, Quinton was still facing charges for using the debit card of a murder victim. This meant that Quinton was already behind bars when officers closed in on him. During the months between November and February, Quinton was interviewed three separate times. The first interview took place on November 2nd, 2015. How far did you go to school? Uh, the eighth and ninth grade. What year did you go to jail? I think I went to jail in 2007. What's that initial charge? Third of her. Let's talk about your relationship with Jessica. How'd y'all meet? We met at the store, right across from my mom. It was really like just a, a science numbers. And then, like, on the next day, we started talking. How often did y'all see each other? I see it like all the time. Now, were y'all we all in a physical relationship, too? Mm -hmm. Meaning you and I got sex? Yeah, we had sex. Okay. Would you have it pretty often or one time? How soon was that after y'all met? I don't even think it was two weeks later. Two weeks later. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. where, did, where did that occur? It was in uh, her car. Her car. Yeah, a little bit of car. Yeah, no. <laughs> I know. I wasn't with her that night. Really? I was. Being honest with you about that? You promised to God on that? You promised on your right mama's hand God, right? right hand to your mama's right? right hand to mama. I wasn't with her that night. Think back, did you, did you see anybody else? Did you talk to anybody on the phone? Mm -hmm. I probably I can't remember if I talked to Joseph that morning. I probably, I want to say I did. just. No, I don't want to lie to you. All right, so she departs. She leaves Eminem. You call her or text her soon after that? I can't remember. Probably, probably did so, but I can't remember. Well, she asked you for money to get her something to eat. So you just went over there and gave her some money? Okay. Did you get in the car with her? Yes, go ahead. Did ride with her at all that night? Did she come in by your house? Okay. Did you see her anymore that night after it got dark? No, sir. During his first interview, Quinton remained buckled down and unfazed by the questioning. He appeared to reply honestly to simple probing questions like how they met and where they met, but refused to admit to spending any time with Jessica that evening. However, during the second interview, investigators cornered Quinton with some of the evidence they had against him. This time, Quinton's story began to change. Now, just for reference, December 6th, Five o'clock. We're now dark. Dark outside. Okay? At five twenty-four. Okay? Five twenty-four. She pulls up to the station. Alright? This is five twenty-nine. You see her phone up there? And guess who she's calling at? You. Yeah. She's calling you. And you can argue that all you want, but I'm telling you, from that point on. That evening, y'all's phones are going to be together, okay? For the next long time, your phone and her phone are in the exact same location. Where's your phone? I promise. And what, and what does it? You were right there with Jessica. It was, it was the same night, because I remember now. I said, come on, I'm going to make sure I get it right. It was that night. I didn't meet her in that parking lot, uh, right there by the top of it. She got $10 and a quarter stack away from um, You're writing out those keys or that keychain? Mm -hmm. Those are keys to her car. Your DNA is uh, is on those keys. Yes. No, 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 no. I mean, I'm telling you the God's truth. That's, yeah. the, that's the honest truth. Your your DNA is on the keys. Well, why? 
That's what we are telling you. That's why yeah. we're being honest with you about everything and following that. I mean, I don't drove a car before. How long before she died do you think you drove that car? Long time ago, I caught it day we went to the uh, liquor store. Was that the week she died, or how how long before she died? I don't know. Okay. Listen to me, buddy. You made a mistake. But when a man lands up and says, I messed up and I am sore. Because you can have one or two things. A man can have mercy or a man can have justice. Anytime, tell the truth. The evidence that we've amassed during the course of this case, I feel extremely good about. And the decisions that you make from here on forward, have the potential to affect the rest of your life. I have no reason to let us know that the God on is true. I'll tell the truth. You'd rather go to court. You'd rather go to court with a jury or something. I told the truth. It ain't even on my heart to kill nobody. When they try you for killing Jessica Chambers, the death penalty is going to be on the tape. You can kill the I'm just telling you how it is, Quinn. Regardless of Quentin's claims of innocence, the evidence told a story of guilt all on its own. It wasn't until the end of his third interview that investigators officially filed the charges for capital murder against Quinton. They gave him a moment to speak with his mother. Quentin Tellis was then handcuffed and escorted back to his cell, where he remained throughout the course of his court proceedings. His trial began in October of 2017. Quentin Tellis pleaded not guilty. My name is John Champion, and I'm the district attorney for Panola County, where we are now, DeSoto County, Tate County, Yellowbush County, and Tallahatchie County, just everything up and down, basically down I-55. This is the part of the trial that we call opening statements, which is where I intend over the next little while to lay out for you what this case is going to be about and what we expect the evidence to show in this case. I want to start by telling you that on December the 6th of 2014, Jessica Chambers was a beautiful, blonde-haired 19-year-old. About two weeks prior to December the 6th of 2014, Jessica met a man that would eventually end her life. She met a man that would change the course of her family, that would change the course of the rest of the life of her family and her friends and everyone that knew her. And that man is Quentin Tellis. District Attorney John Champion presented to the jury that Quentin and Quentin alone murdered Jessica. He stated that the two only recently became friends. However, Quentin quickly became overwhelmingly sexual towards Jessica, which was documented through a plethora of text conversations where Jessica would constantly reject him. The prosecution put forward that on the night of the murder, Quentin had actually assaulted Jessica in her vehicle, where she possibly lost consciousness. A panicked Quentin, who believed that he may have accidentally just murdered Jessica, then decided to burn her body and the vehicle as a way to dispose of the evidence. The result was Jessica waking up on fire, and then experiencing those horrific final moments as described by Cole Haley at the beginning of this video. The defense then gave their opening statement, and unsurprisingly, they chose to build their entire case on top of three little words. It was Eric. The evidence will show that this indeed was a horrible crime, a terrible thing that happened to Jessica Chambers that day. Looks like it's 
right at about three years ago, December. Um, and what happened was that Ms. Chambers actually came walking down Heron Road, where everything occurred that day. She was alert. She was able to speak. And what happened is that she encountered one of the first volunteer firefighters who was dispatched that day. There were at least eight responders who spoke to her. And the evidence will show that Jessica Chambers repeatedly talked to eight different people, if not more. They asked what her name was. Jessica, she said. They asked, who did this to you? And what she did was she told them who did this to her. Many of the first responders completed reports. And what they put in their reports, you'll find that it's in quotes where she said, Eric set me on fire. In quotations. She didn't say any other name. She didn't mention any other person. What she said was that Eric did this to me. His name is Quentin Tellis. She did not say that that day. This case is full of reasonable doubt. And the point is that Ms. Chambers did not say Quentin set her on fire. She just did not say that. And we cannot ignore that. And for this reason, we will ask that you find Quentin Tellis not guilty as a result. Thank you. Although somewhat bleak and rather predictable, the question was whether or not this defense would be effective with the jury. The prosecution would present the following points as evidence of Quentin's guilt. Video footage and cell phone data that linked both Jessica and Quentin together throughout the day and the evening when she was killed. Quentin's DNA being found on Jessica's keys, which were located a quarter mile from the crime scene. A series of messages between Quentin and Jessica, which exemplified Quentin's constant sexual interest, while Jessica would constantly reject him. And video footage from different times throughout the day that would show that Quentin changed his clothes three different times. Two of those times happened following the murder. The defense would argue that every piece of evidence that linked the two together at the time of the fire was circumstantial. The gas station footage took place hours before the fire, and the cell phone data could not be fully trusted, as Quentin's sister lived about a mile away from the crime scene, and it was possible that Quentin visiting her could have corrupted the accuracy. They would argue that the keys only contained Quentin's DNA because he had driven the two to the liquor store within the week prior to the fire. They would state that the sexual messages were always playful in nature, and there is never any negative sexual encounters that should change the way they are perceived. The clothing changes were a tricky one, but the defense seemed to argue that each change was motivated by normal factors like insecurity or dirt. Anyways, throughout the trial, many witnesses and experts took the stand, but the most important testimonies came from the medical examiners, who went on to claim that Jessica's mental state, as well as her internal injuries, would have made it nearly impossible for her to speak coherently. Can you describe this picture for the jury and what you're seeing? This is your larynx that's usually a tube. So it goes down through our throat into our lungs and then starts to branch out left and right. And what you're seeing from your cords down is the soot that is in here that would have been the carbon products that she was breathing in during the fire, which would mean to me it's in an enclosed space. Would that be consistent with a car, a vehicle? Yes, sir. Could these chemicals that you breathe in affect Ms. Chambers' mindset at all? Oh, you know. Sure, I mean, carboxyhemoglobin itself uh, builds up the carbon monoxide. And uh, if you're in that type of environment for too long, the levels go up and then it affects your own mentation. Would it be typical for a person with this degree of burns and this percentage of burns to go through shock? Those that can live go through several phases of that psychological reaction. Number one is, Will I live? 
Will I live with all my body parts? Will I live being able to function? Things along those lines. But from this standpoint, initially, it's, am I, I'm going to die. Given the injury to her lips and her mouth, is it likely that she would have severe difficulties in her speech? Without a doubt. Would you agree that for the most part, her condition would have worsened from when she was initially found to when she got to the burn center? To a certain extent, yes, ma'am. There were at least 10 to 12 other individuals who were speaking to her. That would indicate that she could speak, correct? She could probably speak, but not enunciate well. And so you cannot say with 100% certainty that statements that she made were not made. I wasn't there. Yes, sir. I turn the witness. The argument regarding whether or not Jessica was able to speak clearly really was the main focus for the defense. And it definitely is debatable, given that even Cole Haley also stated that Jessica even mispronounced her own name when he first arrived. Although the prosecution's case was built almost entirely on circumstantial evidence, it was still predicted to be a slam dunk victory for the district attorney. And after the closing arguments were read to end off a six-day trial, the jury then went for deliberation before returning with their verdict. Uh, I have been informed that the uh, jury has reached a verdict in this case. Is that correct? Uh, did you all select a foreman? Uh, all right, sir. Let's see. Mr. Lampkin, is that correct? That is correct. All right. Uh, I just need to, I don't need to know uh, what your verdict was, but I just need to know that all 12 jurors agree on that verdict. Yes, sir, we did. All right. Would you hand the verdict, please, to the court, to the clerk, please, excuse me. We all didn't agree on it. Sir? You said we all agreed on that verdict. We did. All 12, the verdict has to be unanimous. So all 12 did not agree on the verdict? Is that what you're telling me, sir? All right. I'd ask you to step back into the jury room, please. Pass the, pass the verdict, please, to the clerk that you have in your hand. The jury returned to deliberation, and after about an hour had passed, they told the court that they were deadlocked. This resulted in a mistrial due to a hung jury. A retrial took place in September of 2018, and yet again it was declared a mistrial. Tried twice for the murder of Jessica Chambers, but both trials ended in a hung jury. And that was and has many wondering if Quentin Tellis will be tried for a third time. Local 24 News reporter Tish Clark live in the studio now with new information from the district attorney on this very case. Tish. Hi, Katina. Well, Quentin Tellis will go back to Monroe, Louisiana sometime this week. He'll face murder charges down there for killing a college exchange student in July 2015. Investigators say the student was tortured before she was stabbed nearly 30 times in her apartment. Tellis denies killing the student. However, he pleaded guilty to using her debit card and was sentenced to 10 years as a habitual offender. Tellis was then extradited here to Mississippi to face murder charges in the Jessica Chambers case. As for the Chambers case, Case. District Attorney John Champion says he might take Tellus to trial a third time, but he wants to let emotions simmer down a little bit in Panola County, and he wants to talk to the Chambers family before making any decisions. On Wednesday, November 2nd, 2022, officials announced that Quinton Tellus will not face trial for the August 2015 murder of the foreign exchange student named Mandy. And as of June 3rd, 2023, there has not been a date set for a third trial regarding the murder of Jessica Chambers. Quinton Tellus still remains behind bars, serving his 10-year sentence for using the debit card of a murder victim.